Dude on the right is a guy named Bill Cook. He's a leader of an extremist organization called the Black Robe Regiment. It's basically a group of pastors who have agreed to militarize their churches, to teach them how to use weapons and, you know, ammunition and march in lockstep and the whole nine yards. And they also, in the pledge that they signed to be, you know, Black Robe Regiment members, it says that they also agree to, like, endorse specific political candidates every election season. And it's the political candidate that this guy chooses. Donald Trump, of course, this, this time around. Who knows what other nutcase it's going to be next time around. Anyway, I want to listen to what they had to say here. Uh, this is not the first part. If you didn't see the other, don't sweat it. This ends independently of the rest. I'll give context if it's missing. And while we listen, we're going to play some Pokemon Ultraviolet. It's a ROM hack of Fire Red where I can catch every Pokemon. It should just be in the background. won't bother you too much. You never played. All right, let's give this a listen. And it would be more rational to suppose that those who did not resist would receive to themselves damnation. Accordingly, Adams exclaimed in 1775, he said, we are not exciting. He, he learned this from the pulpit. We are not exciting. Wait, I'm sorry. What did he just quote? Accordingly, Adams exclaimed in 1775. He oh, you're talking about John Adams. Okay, in 1775. So this is before the Civil War even ended. And it was 10 years before, 12 years, or even 13 years, before we had a constitution. Before we decided that we were going to have a secular government or whatever. And John Adams is desperate to cram religious nationalism or Christian nationalism down everyone's throats, okay? He said, we are not exciting, he, he learned this from the pulpit. We are not exciting rebellion, opposition, nay, open about resistance by arm to, usurp to usurpation and lawless violence is not rebellion by the law of God or the land. Okay, I, <laughs> yes it is. What? What did he just say? One more time. Opposition, nay, open about resistance by arm to, usurp to usurpation and lawless. Okay, open use of gun. Using guns against a tyrannical force, a self-perceived tyrannical force, of course, is not violence. Violence is not rebellion by the law of God or the land. Okay, it is violence. It's just not rebellion. Um, yes, it is. What are you talking about? Of course it is. I mean, you can say that it's justified, but it's definitely rebellion. He's like completely rewriting history here. What? And the seed of our republic, <coughs> republic was brought over on the Mayflower. De Tocqueville declared the Puritans brought with them to the new world a form of Christianity, which I cannot better describe than by styling it a democratic and republican religion. Um, yeah, okay, so the Mayflower came to the United States, I believe, in 1492, Christopher Columbus and all that junk, and it was people who were sick of living under the state church imposed on them by, um, you know, England, by Queen Elizabeth, or I'm sorry, not Queen Elizabeth, by um, King George and stuff. They were sick of it. They wanted religious freedom, and that's how it was presented. Of course, that really, they didn't want religious freedom. Actually, what they really wanted was to impose their own religion on everybody around them. But yeah, the Puritans, the Puritanical movement, that's what it was all about. It was a Christian extremist denomination, effectively. Oh, Mayflower was in 1620, my mistake. Uh, Columbus was in um, 1492, but Mayflower was in 1620. Okay. This contributed powerfully to the establishment of a republic and a democracy in public affairs. The church was and needs to be today a seminary of liberty. Liberty, we don't... The Bible doesn't preach liberty. What are you talking about? The Bible doesn't espouse or stand for liberty by any stretch of the imagination. The Bible wants religious supremacy, of course. And if you are not a religious supremacist, if you're not a Christian supremacist or whatever, then you are not a legitimate actor in the system and you have no place to operate within it. The First Amendment contradicts the First Commandment. First Amendment, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, so on and so forth. First Commandment is, thou shall have no other gods before me. Oh yeah, and then the blasphemy commandments too, that contradicts the First Amendment. We don't hear this a lot today. Liberty is holy. 
Liberty is sacred. It is the gift of Jesus Christ to his church, the bride of Christ. This is wild to hear him say that liberty is espoused in the Bible. Like what? The church has been given the gift of, in America, has been given the gift of liberty, and we yawn over it. And we say, I don't get involved in politics. I don't preach politics. That's not my job. No, I mean, you're free to get involved in politics. Go nuts. In fact, you should get involved in politics. But you shouldn't be preaching it from the pulpit. Jesus said, be no part of this world. And aside from that, I don't think that a religious interpretation should even be used to justify not getting involved in politics. We live in a country where everybody of all different backgrounds uh, live here with us. We all have to be tolerant of each other. We all have to work together. You trying to impose your will upon people around you is not working together. We yawn about li liberty is precious. Why on April 19, 1775, I'll tell you a bit, a bit more about this in a second. Lexington's congregational minister, he was Jonas Clark. He was a pastor in, in Lexington. And it's just wild to me that he's like talking about how the Bible is in favor of liberty. No, it isn't. Amazing, amazing man. He was considered more dangerous than all the military stores in Concord or in the colony. This is a pastor. And he had so infected the whole district with his calm and deep indignation that when redcoats came marching up the old turnpike to Lexington in the gray dawn of April 19, 1775, after gunpowder and flour, they found all the farmers converted to a doctrine of liberty which armed and provisioned a young nation for seven years of war. Now, Clark wasn't a wimp. He had actually helped Captain John Parker train the militia. And when the More talk about training a militia once again. Like I said, the Black Robe Regiment, his extremist group, did not exist in the early days. This is a fabrication. But he's hearkening back to a historical, mythical past, which is better than, you know, our present, if you will. We're trying to convince everybody that we need to go back to it. So he's trying to build up a justification for this belief when it's just false. He had actually helped Captain John Parker train the militia. And when the, when the Minutemen, that's where the, who the Minutemen were, when they fell out on Lexington, on Lexington Common the night before. Minutemen were actual militias that were trained by the government, to my knowledge. They were there at, two, at 1 a.m., 2 a.m., and Clark went out to greet them on Lexington Green. Clark was just one of many. Bill went through some of these today. Clark was just one of many ministers whose preaching contributed to the ideas in the Declaration of Independence, becoming ubiquitous. That's a big word. How many of you know what ubiquitous means? Really? It means everybody's got it. Everybody knows it. It's ubiquitous everywhere. Everybody knew the principles of liberty in the colonies because of the preaching of the era. They were not mixing religion and government. There were some attempts to do so, and they were quashed by the existing government, which intentionally set out to prevent it from happening. God, this is wild. You went, you went down to... Um, the church down the street next door, and uh, they were talking about liberty. They were talking about the foundations of liberty. They were teaching the principles of good government of liberty. The character and worldview of Jefferson, Hancock, Franklin, John Adams, Patrick Henry, Washington, and other greats who we think of as founders of our, are the fathers of our nation today were forged in the New England pulpit. Now, mythical past shit. This is nuts. To the degree that the American populace has been unafraid of death, they have been free. The men who met their maker on April 19, 1775, about seven of them, other numbers by, uh, by other reports, slightly different numbers, they were ready to meet their maker. Like, I have no idea what he's talking about, but the fact that he's citing other reports makes me super skeptical of it automatically. I mean, I'm already super skeptical of anything this dude says, so... Why is there just an open hole here? That's kind of odd, right? Maker. They weren't afraid to die. And if we're afraid to die, we're not ready to stand for liberty. Because we don't know where, where we're going if we don't, if we don't, uh, if we die. If it had been well known among American clergy that some British leaders were referring to them as the Black Regiment. The Black Regiment was a group of black 
military members from Massachusetts. They were not being called the Black Regiment. I mean, this is so easily falsifiable. 54th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment, also called the Black Regiment, American Civil War. Unit is the second African-American regiment following the 1st Kansas Colored Volunteer Infantry Regiment, organized in the northern states during the Civil War. Authorized by the Emancipation Proclamation, the regiment consisted of African-American enlisted men commanded by white officers. The 54th Massachusetts was a great... I'm sorry. The 54th Massachusetts was a major force in the pioneering of African-American Civil War regiments, with 150 all-black regiments being raised after the raising of the 54th Massachusetts. That's the black regiment. Why is he referring to the black regiment? Because he wants to convince you that it's real. It is not. They would have adopted the name as a badge of honor. They wouldn't have run. What's the local government going to say? What are FBI pre-dawn raids going to say when they hear that? Oh my God, he's afraid of FBI pre-dawn raids. I mean, that should tell you all you need to know about this dude, right? I'm black regiment. That I'm a pastor who's preaching the whole counsel of God that's not afraid to preach liberty. And where does the counsel of God say anything about liberty? I'm, I'm trying to think. I'm struggling. I'm on the struggle bus over here. Jesus is not returning for a passive eschatology. Content that means end times belief, eschatology, end times um, kind of, uh, I guess, yeah, just end times belief. That means end times belief, basically, in eschatology. So he's not returning for a passive eschatology, a passive end times event, okay? Jesus is not returning for a passive eschatology, content to stand by while liberty and its blessings are destroyed. Once again, I say the first amendment contradicts the first commandment. I don't know where you got this idea that Jesus stands for liberty. He stood for principles found in the Bible, and he absolutely hated the rich, like with every fiber of his being. So I'm just like lost. Refusal to address political, po politi political topics. You know, the way that Romans tells you to stay out of politics. From the desk. That's the, that's the old-fashioned way of talking about the pulpit. A refusal to address political topics from the desk is tantamount to sodomy. You are, you're, you're as bad as a gay person if you don't address political topics from the pulpit. What an absolutely wild thing to say. It's no less evil than sodomy because it eviscerates the salt of the earth and seeds the civil society to enslavement. By the way, I didn't know that um, God kind of created a, a hierarchical, like a, a list of the most evil sins in ascending order. Are you trying to tell me the Mosaic Law, which was a list of 613 commandments, that was actually like an ordered list from best to worst? So eating shellfish isn't quite as bad? Is that like what he's saying here? 501c3 nonprofit status, and I just I tell churches today, get rid of it, whatever you have. Yeah, 501c3, if you're unfamiliar, is um, a, it's a nonprofit organization, and they don't have to pay taxes on profits. So uh, nobody has to pay taxes on business expenses. So a, a church spending money on rent, for example won't have to pay taxes on that rent money. Um, same with any other organization. Same with, like, Google doesn't pay taxes on the rent money that they pay. It's only on profits. But 501c3 nonprofit status makes it so that even on profits, you don't have to spend any money on taxes. In trade, you are not supposed to specifically endorse or oppose political candidates. So as a, as a person who is a pastor, who happens to be a pastor, standing in a group of friends, you can say to your congregation of friends as a person that you endorse Donald Trump. But when you're standing on the lectern, at, like at the pulpit, as a pastor, you can't say, I endorse Donald Trump. That's the law. If you do... 
you just have to pay taxes moving forward. They'll take your tax exempt status. Of course, unfortunately, that's not how it works in practical terms. Like realistically, in practice, pastors have been endorsing politicians since the dawn of time, and those politicians have been courting those pastors' endorsements. Like John Hagee, for example. He stood up there. It, well, he endorsed Donald Trump in 2016 and I believe in 2020. And then he, I guess, endorsed Nikki Haley. He also endorsed John McCain. I believe that New Orleans had a level of sin that was offensive to God, and they are uh, were recipients of the judgment of God for that. The newspaper carried the... Well, so Hurricane Katrina was... Louisiana's fault. That's one opinion, I suppose. Story uh, in our local area that was not carried nationally, that there was to be a homosexual parade there on the Monday that the uh, Katrina came. And uh, the promise of that parade was that it was going to reach a level of sexuality never demonstrated before in that was the claim. People were saying that they were going to reach a level of sexuality never reached before. I've never heard that before, but okay. And of the other gay pride uh, parades. So I, I believe that the judgment of God is a very real thing. I know that there are people who uh, demure from that, but I believe that the Bible teaches that when you violate the law of God, that God brings punishment sometimes before the day of judgment. And I believe that the, the Hurricane Katrina was, in fact, uh, the judgment of God against the city of New Orleans. And this was from uh, 2006, 9-16-2006, uh, so September 16th. And here's another one. This one is from um, mid-May 2016, leading up to the 2016 election. Martin I. Moeller said, to see evil and not call it evil is evil. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. God will not hold us harmless. I want you to understand that as an American citizen, you have a responsibility to go vote. I am going to vote for the candidate that's going to make the U.S. military great again because the party in power has reduced us to a World War II level where the Japanese attacked us for the very reason they felt we were too weak to defend ourselves. I'm going to vote for the party that is going to solve the immigration problem, not the one that has created the immigration problem. So he endorsed, uh, up to this point, this is actually legal, 100% legal. He has not endorsed or opposed a political party, campaign, or candidate. I'm going to bring, I'm going to support the party that brings jobs back from China. Oh, yeah, there you go. He endorsed a party. So I guess he is endorsing a party. That This is outside of the bounds of the Johnson Amendment. He should lose tax-exempt status. 2016, they're just not prosecuting these cases anymore is all. Not through international trade agree agreements send millions of jobs to foreign countries because it's cheaper labor and putting millions of Americans out of work. Like this is just fabricated nonsense. I'm not going to vote for the party that has betrayed Israel for the past seven years. He doesn't care about Israel. This guy doesn't. He cares about his end times beliefs and how Israel fits into those end times beliefs. He needs Israel to exist before Jesus can come back. He doesn't give a shit about the Jews. In fact, he even famously said, I have the clip of that too, I'm not going to go into it, but he famously said, Jew, uh, God put Hitler on earth specifically to force Jews back to Israel so that Jesus could come back and the end times would happen and so on. You know, as a result of that, John McCain denied Hagee's endorsement after courting Hagee for the endorsement and trying to get the endorsement. After he said all of that stuff, he condemned it and said he stands with Israel and he doesn't think that, you know, Hitler did all that stuff, or Hitler was put here by God and all that. 
Uh, by the way, this is in the 1990s. Uh, I'm sorry, 1990s when Hagee said that stuff, McCain denounced Hagee's endorsement in 2008, right before the election, I believe. But your own campaign acknowledged that you should have done a better job of vetting oh, sure, Pastor Hagee. Oh, sure. So was it a mistake to solicit and accept his endorsement? Oh, probably. Sure. Uh, so you don't want to want his endorsement. Many things. I'm glad to have his endorsement. So. We are a yeah, anyway, that was um, John McCain saying, I don't want the endorsement. And this is Hagee addressing his comments about Hitler being sent by God. The past 24 hours have been extremely painful and disappointing to me. My disappointment has nothing to do with the fact that I parted company with Senator John McCain. This was by far the best for both of us and best for the country. <laughs> I mean, McCain spent so much time courting this guy's endorsement because he wanted the evangelical vote. And here we are on the other end of it. It is time for the candidates and the media to turn their attention back to the pressing issues of our day. Like the erosion of separation of church and state, for example. And stop focusing upon what I did or did not say decades ago. Did or did not. Oh, my God. I have the clip of him saying it. What has been most disappointing to me is to see my life's work, the great passion of my life, mischaracterized and attacked. It wasn't mischaracterized. I've covered it on my channels before. It's He said it. That's what he said. Hitler was sent by God to force Jews back to the homeland so that Jesus can come back because they have to own the homeland before he can. I have been dedicated. I have dedicated my life to combating anti-Semitism and supporting the state of Israel. In taking a stand for Israel, I have received death threats from anti-Semites and neo-Nazis. I have had the windows of my car blown out beneath the windows of the rooms in which my children slept. Yeah, I, I don't believe a word out of his mouth. To hear people who know nothing about me or my life's work claim that I somehow excuse the Holocaust is... Oh, he did. Again, I have the clip. I'll play a little bit of it in a second. He excused the Holocaust and said that it was necessary and that God sent them, or sent Hitler, to do what he did. Simply untrue and heartbreaking. I have always condemned the horrors of the Holocaust in the strongest terms. Except when he said that Hitler was sent by God. But even more importantly, my abhorrence of the Holocaust and anti-Semitism has never stopped with mere words. I have devoted most of my adult life to ensuring that there will never be a second Holocaust. I have worked tirelessly to oppose anti-Semitism and to ensure the survival of the state of Israel. When? Where? In what ways? How have you fought against anti-Semitism? I don't remember anything about that. I remember you fighting for the state of Israel to exist. Of course, that's part of his end times beliefs. They must. But I haven't heard anything about him like condemning anti-Semitism up until that moment. Uh, like, I didn't want to play this bit, but I guess since I mentioned it, I'll just play the little snippet where he talked about Hitler being sent by God. So it, it's pretty long, so we're not going to play the whole thing. Army, meaning they physically came to life. Now, how is God going to bring them? You're just talking about, like, apocalyptic literature and Ezekiel 37, dry bones and stuff. But let me jump to the important part here. Hang on. Talking about the Jews. How is he going to bring the Jews back to the land? The answer is fishers and hunters. The answer is given in Jeremiah 16, verse 15 and following. God says in Jeremiah 16, Behold, I will bring them, the Jewish people, again into the land that I gave unto their fathers. That would be Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Behold, I will send for many fishers. And after will I send for many hunters, and they, the hunters, shall hunt them. That will be so. The hunters will hunt Jews to force them back to Israel, so that Jesus can return. And they, the hunters, shall hunt them. That will be the Jews from every mountain and from every hill and from out of the holes of the rocks. If that doesn't describe what Hitler did in the Holocaust, you can't see that. He's clearly saying Hitler was sent by God to force Jews back to Israel, right? So think about this. I will send fishers, and I will send hunters. A fisher is someone who entices you with a bait. I'm going to even know who Theodore Herschel was. Anyway, yeah, so there you go. That's 
all the whole thing with um politics and 501c3 status and everything it kind of got off a little bit on a tangent with Hagee there but so that's uh john Hagee. that's his history if you will with the uh johnson amendment it hasn't been prosecuted nobody cares everybody has been break uh, violating the johnson amendment since day one practically at least for the past uh, 30 years since the 90s they just ignore it anyway uh this guy says we should get rid of the johnson amendment churches should give up their tax exempt status completely because that might act as a deterrent to them speaking the word of god um like i said they only have to pay taxes on their profits paying for their rent or their electricity and their everything else even paying the pastor is not taxed nothing about how they use their money is taxed so i honestly have no clue why he would want to give that up or why it would even matter if they do give it up have to do get rid of it you don't need it hey people say well it never gets prosecuted it doesn't matter it's it's controlling speech in the church the most no it's not most destructive piece of legislation, legislative manipulation in U.S. history. Like, you can still talk about political issues. You can still talk about how God hated abortion, even though he specifically endorsed abortion in Numbers 5, 11 to 23. He specifically said you should get an abortion in those verses, but okay. You can talk about how God hated abortion, a political issue, even if you're wrong on that. You can talk about how vaccines are against your religion, even though vaccines didn't exist and God said nothing of the sort in the Bible. You can talk about how God hates gay people, even though that's completely misinterpreting the context of the verses, the six verses in the entire 32,000-verse Bible that even mention it in any way. You can talk about anything you want. It's just endorsing or opposing uh, specific political campaigns parties or candidates that is it and he doesn't want even that he apparently wants to be able to specifically endorse candidates like donald trump because it's a lie it needs to be renounced and and vanquished from the church it's a covenant with the devil and political silence and apathy is an agreement to surrender the civil society and our nation and our children to the spirit of the age Churches that insist on being 501c3, like Esau, have sold their birthright for a mess of pottage. The reason America is near death is that our theological academies no no longer turn out signatories to the Declaration Declaration of Independence. Like John Witherspoon, who had educated a number of the co-signers in the principles of good government. Submission to the Johnson Amendment is the selling of one's soul, again, for a mess of pottage. What a wild thing to say. I'm getting some amens down here. So about almost two years ago in 2022 in the summer, we did a commissioning of pastors. We're going to do another commissioning today. Here's his uh, recruitment. This is his plan to recruit pastors. This is just wild, man. We about 150 pastors participated. They took that Gideon's 300 pledge that's been out on the table. We have a few copies up here, and they signed it. It's a... It it is an iconoclastic act. I I had to look up the word iconoclastic. I've heard it before, but I didn't know, like, you know, the the full context of what it meant. It basically means it's a uh, an act that is heavily criticized by society and it's dangerous. And you're you're like in danger if you do this. He says he's going to be criticized by society for signing on to this extremist group that he's advertising for right now. For a pastor to sign that pledge and conduct their behavior in accordance with it. Which means pulling off their robes after the sermon and giving military training to their congregants, giving their congregants the knowledge of how to use guns, how to aim, how to reload, how to march in lockstep, the whole nine yards. It was the first time in leading the Black Robe Regiment, America's Black Robe Regiment, that I've been attacked, publicly attacked in the media. Somebody said earlier received a postcard from Satan. That's kind of weird. And since then have received postcards every month, I guess in, a, in an effort to, to um, jostle me, rattle my cage. 
That's kind of funny. People sending postcards from Satan to this guy. That's good. I wonder what they said. But um, and I also wonder: Does he think it's actually Satan, or does he think it's just some like uh, left-wing um, protesters or whatever? So I knew that Gideon's three hundred pledge was over the target. It was over. The so I'm acting like a shithead and a complete scumbag and doing absolutely terrible things, hurting the people around me. And when I get criticized for it, it's evidence that I'm right to be that shithead. Sound logic. Haven't heard a sound, uh, an example of more sound logic in my life. Absolutely. The target. And so we just continue to do it. We've had hundreds of pastors around the country assign it, and we're looking for more today. So we've got a few people here that I also are also getting involved in recruiting pastors to sign this pledge, which, will, which I will... Um, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull it. Where is it? Do I have a copy right in front of me? I do not. I'm going to read some of the provisions in the Gideon's 300 pledge so it doesn't sound like an abstraction. This is what it says. It acknowledges certain things. It's called, we call it a covenant. Uh, Gideon's 300 pledge. So I guess this is his, like his recruitment um, pledge that pastors have to sign. Whereas liberty being sacred is the gift of God bestowed by Jesus Christ upon his bride, his church, the bride of Christ. Whereas liberty being sacred is the church's sacred trust. The Lord has entrusted, the, entrusted liberty to the church. The children of disobedience whose actions, whose behavior and thinking are actuated by the, by the prince of the power of the air, uh, are incapable of understanding it. Whereas the church as the light of the world and salt of the earth is the sole curator, trustee, or steward of a civil society and guardian. So I, I guess so far it's just saying that pastors should be in charge, basically, right? Sole curator, trustee, or steward of a civil society and guardian of the blessings of liberty. And whereas the children of disobedience walking according to the prince of the power of the air, are incapable of understanding, much less securing the blessings of liberty. And whereas temporal governance entrusted to the children of disobedience, that's everybody who's not born again, inevitably devolves into absolute despotism. Despotism. So he thinks it's going to be like absolute chaos because nobody is born again, or not everybody is born again, I should say. Well, that's simply false. That's not how it works at all. And whereas my sacred duty, this is, this is a, a church leader speaking, to secure the blessings of liberty to my own generation extends to posterity. And whereas the temporal welfare of my flock is as much my concern as their eternal welfare. You know, we, we, we talk, heard this mentioned a little bit today. You know, pastors say, I'm just getting people saved. God is so I guess he's saying... He wants to get people saved in the name of Jesus, right? The pastor is just looking for an opportunity to bring people to the Word of God, to Jesus, versus talking, you know, endorsing Donald Trump. Say, so I'm just getting people saved. God doesn't want us to just be concerned about people's eternal welfare. He wants us. He doesn't. Us to be concerned about their temporal welfare. Yeah. What? Their temporal welfare? What the hell does that mean? We have a sacred duty to do whatever we can to ensure that the temporal well-being of our flock is taken care of. I don't know what that means. Temporal welfare? Temporal means time. So their welfare throughout time? I don't know what he's talking about here. Otherwise, we are slaughter dressing cattle. We are not shepherding sheep. With these things in mind, I will not separate my role as their pastor from, pastors from matters that have a direct bearing on their eternal, temporal or eternal welfare, nor my role as a shepherd from the deliberations and actions of civil government. I will preach the whole counsel of God. I will preach a minimum of one election sermon prior to every election. I will instill in my flock a biblical worldview by teaching and preaching every truth in the Bible. And I will adjure, adjure, A-D-J-U-R-E, we, we don't use that term anymore a lot, but it really means I will command my flock to vote in every election. That is insane. He's just creating an extremist group that will be weaponized against the political system and be taught 
to use, you know, guns and ammunition training in the whole nine yards. That is nuts. For the most godly candidates is a sacred duty incumbent upon everyone professing faith in Jesus Christ. I will provide ample opportunity for every member of voting age within, within my flock to register to vote, and I will seek to partner with other pastors in my local community to establish and maintain a culture of liberty, both within the local church and within our local community. Culture of liberty. I love that he keeps using that phrase. Does he even know what that word means? What does that word mean to him? The members of our churches need to understand that if they, are, if they aren't voting, they're committing a great sin. No, they're not. They are not committing a sin by not voting. God said in the Bible, if you, know, you believe God inspired the word of, uh, or I'm sorry, if you believe that God inspired the Bible's writing or whatever, God said in the Bible, the governing authorities are there by his direction, and you don't need to worry about them. They are for better or worse, in the positions that they're in by God's, uh, with God's blessing, basically. Maybe they're really bad people. Well, maybe God put them there to teach the good people a lesson. You know, that's the general idea. Do, not to say that Christians shouldn't be involved in politics at all. It's just Christian churches as a unit shouldn't be involved in politics. That's my interpretation of those verses. But any interpretation at all should at least include the idea that you shouldn't like endorse any political candidates the way that this guy's describing at the very least right from the pulpit it's a great sin and god is going to hold us accountable for that and tell me what you think about it in the comments these people need help man for real and we need to continue to follow this extremist group